I would like to thank our three panelists very, very much for being here. Uh, Amanda Krauss with uh, US Rowing, uh, Ted Benford from uh, Community Rowing Inc. up in Boston, and Matt Logue uh, with Three Rivers Rowing Association. So many thanks to all of you. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Tomas Herrera Mischler, and I'm the CEO and president at the Sun Coast Nature Center Aquatic um, Associates Inc., which is uh, uh, better known locally as Senka. And um, I wanna ask everybody to go on mute so that we can have the best uh, audio conditions possible. And uh, the other thing is I want to ask everybody to submit questions via chat uh, Steven Rodriguez, who is the COO at Sanka, will be monitoring those questions. And hello, Steven, thank you for being here. And he will be um, selecting questions to submit to the different uh, speakers on our panel after their presentations. We're going to have three presentations, uh, about 12, 10 to 12 minutes each. And uh, then we will go into uh, a question period. Now, if you all should choose not to submit questions, I will randomly call on you for a question. So uh, if you'd like to avoid that, please submit questions. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, one of the reasons why we wanted to have this presentation on community rowing is that uh, there's been a plan to build a community center boathouse at Nathan Benderson Park. And in order to understand better what that community part, at least from an aquatic sports and rowing perspective looks like, I thought we would ask three of the best practitioners in the nation to talk about their experiences in community rowing. Um, I'm also just delighted to welcome the chairman of our board, Ron Chapo. Ron, thank you for joining us. We're delighted you could be here with us today as well. Uh, and all of the other 99 guests who are joining us for this conversation. Uh, Jason Puckett with the county, thank you also for joining us as well. Uh, as we really think about this uh, programming for this building, it's what then sets the stage for how we go about designing and building and promoting this project in the future. So uh, it's really, this is an educational opportunity for Sanka and for Sarasota as a whole and anyone else who's on joined us on this call to really think about community rowing. Uh, there's been a lot of work done in this community to develop community rowing. And it's uh, been led by, um, folks at uh, Sarasota Crew and uh, Scholars, and we're really uh, extremely grateful for the work that Casey Galvanek has done at uh, Sarasota Crew to uh, really do outreach and get more and more young people involved in the sport of rowing here in our region and across the country. So Casey, thank you for for joining us and for being a part of that. I'm also delighted that Curtis Jordan has joined us. He's another member of our board. Curtis, welcome. Delighted to have you. He's a, a, a star in the world of rowing. So thank you for being here with us today too. Uh, you know, we're, we're certainly living in a very uh, sort of fast changing world. And uh, as we plan for a permanent structure in the park, it's very important to gather as much input as we possibly can. And so i uh, really like to um, turn it over now to um, Matt Logue. He's the executive director at Three Rivers Rowing Association in Pittsburgh. And he's a member of the US Rowing uh, Safety Committee and an assistant level referee for US Rowing. He's driven to make rowing more accessible and safer for everyone and approaches this drive with a community growth mindset. Uh, he's also worked at uh, the Director of Community Rowing for Row New York. Uh, Matt oversaw all of their adaptive and para rowing programs, middle school, indoor programs, juvenile justice programs, and adult programs. Wow. Okay, Matt, with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, uh, thanks for inviting me to this panel. Uh, really feel fortunate to be here. Uh, talk a little bit about our rowing club with you today. Um, I have a very short slide deck that I'm just going to share the screen on quickly, um, kind of guide through this just a little bit. Um, but um, 
Uh, yeah, as Tomas said, my name is Matt Logue. I'm the executive director here at Three Rivers Rowing Association. Uh, I just started here in February of 2019, and um, it's been an incredible two couple of years here in Pittsburgh. Um, the organization itself was founded in 1986, and it's just been an incredible leader within the sport of rowing um, since it was uh it was founded. Um, the mission from day one here has been to develop and deliver safe, sustainable, and inclusive programs and events that promote the benefits of rowing and paddling to our diverse community. Um, in addition to being a, a traditional rowing club, uh, we also do offer paddling programs, both Dragon Boat, Outrigger Canoe, um, and this year we're actually going to be expanding more into um, kayaking with some local partners here on the Allegheny River. Uh, really tr want to make sure that our, our docks and our water access here in Pittsburgh are accessible to everybody, and we're um, leveraging the other relationships that we have here on the river to make sure anybody that wants to get out on the water has that opportunity. Um, we, Three Rivers is home of two campuses. Um, they share the same body of water. Um, so our Washington's Landing campus is actually on an island of the Allegheny River, and our Millville campus is connected on the backside of the island in what we call the back channel, um, just about 500 meters upstream from our Washington's Landing campus. So the two facilities together really allow us to um, offer a great deal of on-water uh, oppor opportunities and programming. Our Washington's Landing campus um, is a home to um, indoor training centers, weight rooms, offices, uh, there's community meeting rooms, um, as well as um, eight bays full of boats um, that are uh, not just club owned and operated, but we also have our home to three of the local universities, uh, University of Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon University, and Duquesne University um, row out of this campus. Uh, and we also have a very large logbook sculling contingent that rows out of this campus as well, which is adult rowers uh, that ha either have their own equipment um, or use, uh, we have club singles and club doubles that are available to um, our adult members um, that have passed a uh, sculling certification. So again, just trying to maximize um, individuals' opportunities to get on the water, either through direct programming or if um, they want to row or, or paddle on their own. Our Millville campus um, is really the home base of our paddling programs. Uh, we have two dragon boat programs that row that paddle out of that facility, um, as well as outrigger canoes and. Uh, and we're growing into kayaks um, this summer as well. Uh, there is some rowing that does take place there. Um, some of our affiliated high schools do row out of there and we will be doing a lot more of our summer learn to row camps um, out of the Millville campus as well. Um, it is, we are incredibly fortunate to have some indoor rowing tanks, which um, are coming incredibly handy, particularly being in a Northern climate where we don't have access to uh, rowable water 12 months a year. Um, but again, much like Washington's Landing, our Millville campus is home to uh, meeting rooms, uh, weight training and ERG facilities, um, and is located right in uh, Millville Riverfront Park. So it's, we have a doors open policy with the community there, right on a riverfront trail, which is an incredible aspect of Pittsburgh. The trail that, at, fun story, the trail that runs in front of our Millville Boathouse connects Pittsburgh with Washington, D.C. So for uh, uh, some of our cross training for the summer, a lot of our athletes like to bike that, bike that trail. Um, and uh, the stories they come back with are pretty incredible. It really adds to the community atmosphere here. Um, as far as the program scopes that we run here, um, we run the gamut, everything from youth starting in about fourth grade um, to adult. Our oldest active member uh, that competed at our, our head race last year was 82 years old and is continuing to train here uh, still. So it really, it re really reinforces the lifelong sport aspect that, that both rowing and paddling can provide for the community. Um, on the youth side, our Three Rivers Youth Program is incredibly community oriented. It consists of um, middle school and high school students from various schools and communities throughout Allegheny County here in uh, southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, most of these students attend schools that do not have their own rowing program. So we're 
through this club program, we're able to provide the opportunity to learn how to row, learn how to train, and learn to compete um, throughout the year. Um, this program has been incredibly successful um, over the years. Um, in 2019, uh, we had our first youth national championship gold medal winner. Uh, they are consistently a top 10 uh, program um, in the nation and top three at our Midwest regional championships. First Row 2.0 is a real exciting program that we're actually just launching this summer. Um, I'm personally really excited about it as it's a little bit unique in the sense that we are taking the sport of rowing to the communities and partnering with the Pittsburgh Public Schools uh, Charter School as well as several community organizations to introduce um, the benefits of rowing and the sport directly um, in the communities and in the schools themselves. Uh, from there, it is our goal to pave the road from the community to the boathouse and develop that intrinsic motivation to uh, bring more people down to the water and experience the on water side of rowing. Um, our summer camps, um, you know, are an incredible program for us. We have people on the water during the summer from 5.15 in the morning till 9 p.m. at night, six days a week. Um, and that's a combination of youth and adult and adaptive programming and our logbook programs, uh, really taking advantage of the summer conditions here on the Allegheny River. Um, as I mentioned before too, we do have several scholastic programs that do operate out of our boathouse during the school year. Um, as well as the three colleges that also train out of here uh, during their school year as well. On the adult side, um, again, we want to we offer a full range of programs, everything from adult learn to row and introduction to rowing and paddling to high level competitive masters that'll train and race um, at masters nationals. We've had crews compete at the masters world regatta. Um, our paddlefish uh, is our drag is our community dragon boat program open to all ages. Um, they travel throughout the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic regions to multiple events per year. Um, and Hearts of Steel is a, another great program that we're proud to offer here that's exclusively for breast cancer survivors. Um, and that's a program we've seen a lot of growth with over the last couple of years. Um, and they are actually um, in the process of fundraising to go and compete at the World Dragon Boat Championships in New Zealand next year. Uh, so the opportunities are just abound within the paddling community right now. And we're super excited to be supporting those programs um, here at Three Rivers. And again, the logbook sculling and paddling program is just a really great opportunity for people that maybe want to come down in the middle of the day or can't commit to their schedule because of their schedules to a full training, full time training pro with a program. Um, we still are able to provide on water opportunities for these individuals. And uh, we have about 120 active logbook scholars and paddlers um, that really were able to get a lot of water time in those single person boats last year, particularly in the pandemic, um, which was which was great to make to see the people getting out um, during that time. Uh, adaptive and para rowing is a, our programs that are incredibly important to us. Three Rivers opened in 1986 and our para program was founded uh, at the end of the following year, 1987. So we've been had one of the longest established adaptive rowing programs in the country. Uh, we are in the process of hiring our first full-time director of adaptive rowing. Uh, we see this as an incredible growth area for our organization and for the community here, simply based on um, a lot of advances in rowing technology and accessibility um, with the customization of boats. We're incredibly fortunate here in Pittsburgh to have a large healthcare and health research community. Um, the Wounded Warrior Projects uh, Mid-Atlantic headquarters is literally right down the street from us. And when you talk about programs that have uh, just an incredibly deep and instant impact. I think it's really hard to top adaptive and para rowing. And, you know, this one kind of caught me by surprise. Real quick story. I was first introduced to adaptive rowing at Row New York. And I remember my first recreational adaptive practice there. I was literally four days out or into the new job. And uh, my previous rowing club, Westside Rowing Club, uh, did not have an adaptive rowing program and had a very, um, competition oriented mindset and we 
at row new york we had rowing barges so we were able to put um athletes out in a rowing barge and with adaptive rowing you really have to customize each seat to make sure each athlete is safe and has a good positive experience out on the water we took the time to do that the coaches and volunteers were incredible we shove off the dock we take 10 we start taking strokes and oars are all over the place but the barge is moving and after it couldn't have been more than 20 strokes the coach said okay time to turn around and go in uh, for the end of practice and i couldn't believe it it was like after 10 strokes, we're already going in. And <laughs> we turned around to the dock and all of the caretakers and family members, there was a railing and a deck overlooking the lake. Um, and they're all leaning there, just kind of staring out at us. And me not coming from West, I was like, oh no, they're all mad. We're going in. They're going to be furious that it's so short and we're coming in already. I was like, all right, well, maybe not. So we take the 10 strokes back to the dock. I get up and I look up at the deck again and everybody hasn't moved, still on the railing, stone cold stoic faces. I was like, they're going to be mad. And here it is my first week. Uh, the coach did an incredible job. I'm not going to let them be mad at the coach. So I'm going to take this one. I'm going to be the first one up there and uh, see what's going on. And I start to carry oars up the ramp and I notice two family members peel off the railing and it's just like, here it comes. All right, getting ready for it right off the bat. I, I can remember this vividly. I took, a, I looked down, I took a breath, I forced a smile as I looked up. And at this point, the individuals were about 10 feet away from me. And both of these individuals just had tears running down their face. And it was, thank you, thank you, thank you. My daughter hasn't smiled this much since her accident. My granddaughter hasn't been out of the wheelchair in six months. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I froze. I didn't know what to think at that point. Um, you know, out here I thought it was gonna be like, why did we only take 20 strokes total? And it was just this game changer of a moment. And I turned around and looked and every single person in that barge just had the biggest smile on their face and the the greatest experience with that. So that really flipped my mindset completely and just um, magnified the impact of what our sport and what these opportunities can provide and almost been chasing that moment ever since and trying to get as many individuals as possible to experience that moment, to experience being on the water, to experience moving a boat under your own power. Um, things that just never seen, may have never seemed possible before really are. And our sports are great entryways and great opportunities to do that. Um, so we're trying to really expand on that again. Um, and we're also very proud to host um, three major events a year. Head of the Ohio is our biggest event to finish it. The finish line is literally right in downtown Pittsburgh, uh, right under, right behind Heinz Field and PNC Park. Um, so it's really great opportunity for the community to see our sports and expand from there. Um, and I'm I promise I'll stop rambling right now. I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but we're getting um, there, Matt, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Wrap it up. <laughs> there we go. Um, I'll, I'll just say there, I mean, uh, we strive to be leaders on the water and off and just are really passionate about making um, the water and rowing and paddling accessible to all. Oh, Matt, thank you so much. That was awesome. I know that everybody is, uh, was touched by that story and, uh, I think, you know, uh, don't forget to use your reactions if you want to. Uh, I'm giving you a big thumbs up for that one. Thank you. Um, I see the questions coming in. And so I want to encourage everybody to continue submitting questions using the chat uh, so that Stephen Rodriguez, our COO, can uh, choose some and uh, we'll uh, pose them to our um, panelists afterwards. So uh, Ted, you've got a t tough act to follow, but uh, Ted uh, Benford is the Executive Director at Community Rowing Inc. in Boston. Just delighted to have you with us. Uh, Ted started his relationship with Community Rowing more than 25 years ago as a volunteer um, and a coach. And then he later went on to serve as the president of the board um, and as a trustee. So he's been hanging around this place for a long time. Um, he was selected as the executive director in uh, 2018. Uh, outside of CRI, he's also got a full life. He's worked extensively in higher education, 
He started his own company and he's worked in consulting and special project partnerships with senior level leadership in Fortune 1000 companies. So Ted, thank you so much for joining us and sharing some of your time and wisdom with us this evening. Well, thank you, Thomas. And uh, it's a pleasure to meet everybody. And uh, thank you for the privilege of, uh, of speaking today. I, I'm, I'm excited to, to share our story. Um, uh, sort of on, on parallel with that, I'm, I too am gonna share my screen and give you some slides. Uh, the benefit between my presentation and, and Matt's is that I've I've read the, the questions in the Q&A, so now I get to answer all your questions and look like a hero. So <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'm super excited about that. Uh, but I'm uh, going to go ahead here and just um, get going with my screen. Um, so again, thank you. Um, I think the uh, one of the big questions about community-based organizations and community rowing organizations is the difference between clubs and um, and what what how the how community organizations function uh, and so like like uh, three rivers CRI um, has a mission to provide and invite anyone regardless of their background ability or experience to grow through rowing so that is our our mission statement um, I'll tell you a couple stories through the course of this, but uh, but our board in, in the fall of 2019 revised our mission, our core values, and our strategic plan. And so we we had a much longer mission statement, and we sort of brought it down to this. Um, but the idea being that that uh, we are um, in many ways uh, a philanthropy, and uh, as we know in philanthropy, uh, no money, no mission. And with regard to the way we have uh, organized and reorganized community rowing, we really do sort of two primary things. We, we raise money and we serve our donors and we provide them uh, some form of transformation through uh, the experience of supporting us, whether it's a grant funded uh, uh, opportunity or, or individual donors. And then also we obviously run programs and operations. And one of the things that's nice about community-based organizations, many of them generate revenue through both channels, both sources, both fundraising as well as program revenues. In the case of CRI, we're about a 60-40 split. 40% 40 of our revenue comes from uh, fundraising for what we call grant funded or funded programs. And then we have about 60% of our revenue comes through actual revenue generating uh, uh, groups. Now, one of the things that um, we've really looked at very hard is as, a, as an organization, where do we need to excel? Like, what is the one thing, if we're, if we're gonna decide what we're gonna do really well, what is the one thing we're gonna do well? And uh, the senior team and I during COVID, while there was just an unbelievable amount of uh, uh, ambiguity and complexity, tons of uncertainty, um, tremendous volatility in the decision-making of how the, how the organization was gonna function through COVID, we also took some time to think about uh, the statement that comes up a lot, at least in the Boston philanthropic community, which is X organization changes lives. And on our website, we had the statement, rowing changes lives. And one of the things that I thought a lot about was, uh, you know, having been a coach for a long time, I knew that to be true, but there's more to it than that. Uh, and at community rowing, unlike many boat clubs, what we learned through some research is that over 98% of the people we serve have their experience of rowing shaped by a member of our staff, by a coach. And when you think about the transformation in any activity, it is as much the activity as the mentor or the person who introduced you or the person that walked you down the journey and your own path in your exploration of yourself. In this case, growth through rowing. So what we thought about was really thinking and, and focusing on transformation for our beneficiaries, not just our rowers, but our beneficiaries. And our beneficiaries obviously are our rowers. Um, and for those, uh, uh, just, just to share a little bit about CRI, we serve just, or, just around 10,000 people a year, 5,000 kids in the city of Boston Public Schools through 40 Boston Public School relationships. And then about 5,000 people come through our facility on a, in a given year, obviously not last year. If the staff change the lives of our rowers, then we must provide our staff transformation as professionals. And 
creating an organization that supports the professional development of our staff, has robust HR functions, pays them appropriately, obviously follows some of the due diligence as a, of a good organization, um, but really thinking about how young people, maybe in their first job, maybe in their, you know, like me, sort of on the other end of their, on the, you know, more, more, fewer summers than they've had in the past, but the idea being that as an organization, we must excel at serving our staff. And then really also, when we think about donors, one of the things that came clear during COVID was our fundraising efforts were quite successful. And one of the things that I think about when reflecting on that is the idea that the, 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 the fundraising commitment of the organization, we're not ashamed about the money we raise. We don't apologize for trying to get people support for it. And one of the things about rowing is that we can celebrate the, the stories that, that, that Matt shared, uh, that we all have with uh, compelling experiences in our lives. And people that want to support that, either their wealth, their wisdom, um, uh, uh, can do that, but that that's actually part of the experience of being part of the CRI community and that we want to celebrate that. And then the other piece of this, when we think about an organization is not only what are we good at, you know, like everybody in rowing talks about, you know, they're Olympians who are great Olympians, but they're not great coaches. Um, and a lot of uh, uh, great, great coaches uh, uh, were never fantastic athletes, but they were incredibly thoughtful about the sport, which helped them. I sort of proud of that. I was, I was one of those non-athlete coaches kind of person. But what we found in some management review of our staff, which we now do every year, is one of the things that binds our community together is the fact that our not only do our staff shape the experience of the people who row at CRI, but they also care deeply. They care deeply about those they serve and they care deeply about those who work at CRI because of the degree of co cooperation and collaboration that's required. And I'll show that to you in just a second. So we've come out and talked about our North Star being care for our people. And, and with that, we can change some mindsets, we can work on policies and procedures, but we can also uh, uh, have our community and bridge the gap between our community, our staff, and our rowers in a way that is also more authentic and genuine. So looking at CRI, sort of some of the nuts and bolts, uh, I said we serve about 10,000 people. We do two things. We raise money and we, and we function and we operate. Uh, a quick breakdown of that is that our development group is funded through both annual fund giving as well as grants. And we've broken our programs really down into three areas, adult and youth programs, youth development, and then the facility and coaching education. Um, CRI, uh, I, I inherited an organization that was one of the few in the sport that not only has a, a pretty large and sizable workforce, but we also run a, a coach certification program called the Institute for Rowing Leadership which was originally founded to, to train our staff and became more formalized and actually became a certificate program. But part of the question of running a community-based organization is how do you develop and manage your staff? And, and we feel that we are going to, coming out the other side of COVID, continue to double down on the professional development of our staff through coaching education. Uh, but just to get into, again, some of the more sort of nutsy and boltsy kind of things, on the adult and youth programs, we run adult programming basically as a cohort. And what I've done on this slide below, I'm terrible at making slides, but anybody in the middle here would be a full-time staff person. Anytime you see a coordinator, those are part-time staff persons. Uh, so most of our adult programming runs on its own. Um, we have a coordinator who runs our uh, logbook sculling program, similar to Three Rivers, which is this cohort and our private boat owners are the only people who are permitted to row from CRI without a coach. Sculling classes, adult competitive, sweet throwing, learn to row classes for youth. All of our programs are supported by staff. Uh, on the youth recreation program, uh, we run three programs, a learn to row for kids, a crew league, which is sort of a sixth, seventh, eighth grader program, and then a summer one week and two week program. We don't run any camps. Uh, new in 21, we're gonna create a, a part-time coordinator for our youth recreation to coordinate staff. It's logistically, Middle schoolers are hard enough to control without somebody at least trying to keep all the kittens in the box, as they say, and it's pretty hard to do without someone administrating that. So we're going to we're going to add that staff position. 
in our inclusion programs um, is comprised of non-elite para programming. So similar to Matt, para rowing is in the bones of our DNA. Uh, when we talk about providing people access who would not otherwise have uh, the experience, ability, or background to, to row, it's a very big part of our ethos and our culture. Uh, there's a program for kids who are um, uh, challenged by obesity uh, and our military veterans program, which serves anywhere from about 250 to 500 people, depending on the year. Uh, and then our youth indoor program, I've shared a little bit about that, about 5,000 kids, 40 plus schools, uh, Boston Public Schools are, are partners with us and our community-based organization partnerships, CBOs, the YMCA, Boys and Girls Clubs, and many other organizations. And we have a full-time staff member who coordinates that. On the youth development side, one of the things about CRI is that winning is not in the job description of a single coach at CRI. So when we talk about our core values and what is important to us about the transformation that comes from rowing, uh, the medals are the last thing that we think about. Uh, and so we've got a competitive youth program that is, is thriving and quite successful. We have a program that serves kids in, this, in the Boston public school system through its own program called the Row Boston program, uh, originally called the G-Row program. Uh, and uh, something that again is part of the DNA of our organization. Uh, and then we've created a new program, which is specific to youth development, which is we have a we have a backlog of both kids who want to be in the Row Boston program, as well as the youth competitive program who either aren't going to make the team. You know, you got a 5'11", 115 pound, you know, eighth grader boy who just needs to eat a lot more potatoes and some some more hamburgers before he can join the varsity team. And so they go into our youth development program. We put some effort into the conversation around diversity, equity, inclusion as part of that change in our, our core values. Uh, and so we've really focused that in three primary areas. Allyship, which is to explicit, explicitly support our allies in our community, internally among our staff and our people, and externally. Continue to focus on community and connection, which is not just what CRI can do, but what we as a community can do, what you and CRI, what we can be in our community, both for our staff and our community. And then we're going to be focused on actually diversifying CRI, which is a focus on hiring and obviously a focus on recruiting athletes. So the, the diversification happens on both fronts. Just wanted to add the, the, the pillars of our strategic plan for those that might be interested. Uh, it's really four things. Um, uh, following the change in our core values uh, around diversity, uh, our first pillar is around uh, JEDI. Um, uh, the second is to focus on community engagement. Uh, operational health is everything to an organization when it comes to actually talking about transformation and care and then financial resilience. Uh, and so that's, uh, I spoke pretty quickly, um, but uh, you know, as they say, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, CRI was started in 1986, um, and uh, we've been we've been thriving ever since. Uh, Ted, thank you so much. I really appreciate your comments, and uh, I'm going to applaud you this time. So thank you. Uh, obviously, I just I wish we had way more time with each of our speakers. There's just so much there. Uh, just your four pillars of your strategic plan. Oh, I'd love to dig into that too. So. Thank you and uh, for giving us this great overview of your programs. Um, it's now my real honor and pleasure to introduce my friend, Amanda Kraus. She's the CEO at US Rowing and uh, the founder of Row New York. And uh, she started by putting five bucks in a savings account and a bank account and reading a book about starting nonprofits. So she really built that program from scratch uh, she found a lake to row on and raise some money to get things up and going and um, ultimately built an organization with a $5 million a year operating budget. Uh, so it's, uh, I think Row New York really became a, a critical example for diversity, equity, and inclusivity efforts in the rowing community. And now she's taken over uh, US Rowing, which is uh, really the primary uh, rules organization, governing organization for rowing in the United States. So uh, congratulations to Amanda for uh, this new position. And thank you for taking some time out of your vacation here in Florida to uh, share some of your insights with us. Thanks, Tomas. 
And it's so good to see Matt and Ted. Um, I've known both of them for a really long time. And as Matt said, had the pleasure of working with Matt at Row New York. So I'm a big fan of both. Um, please tell me if you start to lose me. Um, I'm surprised I can even get on Zoom here. Um, so I'm a little bit in the boonies, but uh, I thought I would start, I, I don't have a slide presentation, but I thought I would just start with my row New York hat on for folks, and then I'll shift over to U.S. rowing. Um, as Tomas said, with my, in terms of row New York, I did start that organization. I had been a coach at Community Rowing. Ted and I did not overlap, but um, I was there as one of the first Girls Row Boston coaches, and I was so inspired by that program that brought competitive rowing to girls from under-resourced communities, mostly black and Latina girls in Boston that I knew I wanted to start something similar in New York city. And that's why um, I moved, I'm from New York. So moved back to New York and started Row New York. And whenever people say, I'm not sure how to do this, or it might be too hard. I always say, if I could do it in New York city where we really didn't have any rowing infrastructure I didn't know anyone really to help me get, get this thing started. Um, I didn't know much about anything even after college and graduate school and a little bit of coaching, but I knew that rowing had the ability to change lives and I'd seen it in Boston and that was sort of all I needed to know. And I put the blinders on and as Tomas said, put $5 in a Chase checking account and learned everything I could about organizational structure and staffing, coaching, um, begging and borrowing for equipment in the early years, board management, and of course, fundraising, board building and, and fundraising. Um, and so we, we grew every year since we started with that pilot program in 2002. And we're about four and a half years in pre-construction for a large community boathouse on the Harlem River. So I have a lot of experience now in, in that space. Um, Matt has also had experience in building a boathouse. And um, Ted, I don't know, were you part of building CRI's boathouse? I don't remember. I, was, I don't I, know. I, I, I um, got the idea and then I, I um, they made me a trustee. So I just ran didn't the other way. The work. Yeah, I didn't have to do any of the work. It was great. That was wise. That was wise. Um, yeah, so it's quite a beast of a project. It's exceedingly complicated because we're building it on land in New York City on the water where there is no infrastructure. So we're, um, it, it couldn't be much more complicated and therefore more expensive. So um, I've learned a lot about that, that piece as well. And I'm still on the board of Row New York, so still helping with that project. Um, I would say, you know, similar to CRI and to Three Rivers, you know, we do a lot of work with kids at Row New York. Um, the majority of our young people row for free. So we don't do scholarships. It's, it's most of our kids just do not pay to participate. Uh, we combine rowing with academic support for our, for our young people. And as Matt said, we also do adaptive rowing. So any New Yorker with a physical or cognitive disability can come and row with us. So we have multiple programs um, under that umbrella. And um, I'm going to keep this kind of short because I know we don't have a lot of time and I'd love to get to answers to questions that you all have. I've shifted over to U.S. rowing in November. And so now I'm learning a lot about the high performance space because U.S. rowing is the governing body for the sport of rowing. So it's everything for our tens of thousands of members, organizational members, regattas, and of course, our national team that's competing in Tokyo this summer. So um, a piece that I'm really committed to bringing to U.S. rowing is to make the sport more diverse and inclusive. Uh, for too long, uh, this sport has been sort of associated with elite colleges, or at least has that reputation, right, of being largely, you know, not accessible to people of color or people coming from sports where, um, or sorry, backgrounds where rowing just isn't a part of the culture. So the idea is to just make it known that, you know, the space can be welcoming and Tomas and I have fun conversations about this and uh, that there's, there's, a, there's a place for anyone who wants to be a part of the sport. And I think it's U.S. Rowing's responsibility to really lead, lead on that front. So uh, that's been a priority of mine since I started in November. And I'd say that's, you know, a lot of that work is coming out of our DEI committee. I would say for anyone who's planning on starting, you know, if you're thinking about, or as you think about this community rowing, 
Boathouse, um, I'd say you, you're off to a good start with Tomas at the helm there of that project because he's thinking about all the right things uh, in terms of getting the buy-in ahead of time, hearing from people, uh, seeing you know what, what people want this space to look like and, and how it should be used. And people might have different versions of what that looks like. And uh, I don't think there's a, a right or a wrong. And I think I'm, I'm going to speak for Matt and Ted for a second. I think you guys would agree that the idea is, you know, um, as many people as you can getting out there on the water, using those boats, making it accessible and welcoming. And, um, you know, it's not just about elite rowing. It's about letting people have that experience in rowing and letting them see themselves in the sport. It's about getting coaches from different backgrounds in. And we can get into all the logistics. I know there's some questions around, you know, coach to rower ratio. We can talk about all of those things. These guys are great operations people, both of them. They're much better at that than I am. Um, but I'd say, you know, the devil's always in the details and doing it safely. There's nothing more important than that. I think we, we know that, um, you know, is keeping, keeping everyone safe on the water and then building a community boathouse. It's really people can all see themselves in because it can be very intimidating to, to folks, right, to show up at a boathouse and think, oh, wait, I don't look like those Olympians, right? It's this big stretch from this is me. I'm maybe not comfortable on the water. And then am I supposed to be a six, four man or six, two woman and comfortable jumping into those skinny boats? No. And there's a way to, to make it, make it welcoming and make it accessible. And um, I'd say these folks know that better than anyone. So I don't know, Tomas, if you want to move into questions or I just wanted to be mindful of time. There oh, we you're go. muted, Tomas. I think I'm unmuted now. So uh, Amanda, thank you so much. And I, I think that uh, we could probably move into questions. I know that I've seen a steady flow of them coming in. I just also wanted to acknowledge my friends from the Newtown Opportunity Rose uh, program. Uh, they've joined us and they're uh, just amazingly dedicated to getting children in the black community here in Sarasota involved in, um, in rowing in many different forms. And they're just incredible. Amanda, you had the opportunity to meet these men and their passion for their community is amazing. And uh, so I'm just delighted that you're here with us today. Um, the, uh, Me too. I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Stephen to pose uh, some of the questions that have come in. And uh, Stephen, are you ready or? Yeah, yeah, oh, I am okay. ready. All right, so Stephen, you should turn on your camera so we okay. can see your handsome face. Uh, Stephen is the Chief Operating Officer here at Nathan Benderson Park. As I like to say, he's the man that makes the magic happen at the park. So, uh, Stephen? All right, well, there's a lot of wonderful questions, and I think I'm going to start uh, with combining two for each of the panelists, and that is going to the beginning, and that is, you know, in order to have a community rowing program, you need to have people participating. So, how do, how, what advice would you give uh, to anyone starting a community uh, rowing program to attract individuals, to really develop uh, participation? And then also what priority wise, what are the most important things that you need to offer? Uh, is it a boathouse? Is it boats? Is it coaching and so forth in order to, to have a successful program? Amanda, do you wanna start? Sure, I, I would say the most important thing, I mean, yes, you do need some boats. I'm not gonna lie to you. Um, boats are a good start, you know, it, you need some equipment. And, um, but I'd say the most important piece really are the, the coaches who you, who you hire. Um, and in my mind, those are really, especially if you're thinking about, I know there's a question here about getting less privileged youth to commit to rowing. Um, listen, your, your coaches need to be youth developers. Uh, and so I, it's not really about, you know, did they win a division one championship? What's their ERG score? It's really about, are they going to be able to connect with young people? And are they going to help the young people connect with one another? And that's, what's going to keep them. Are they going to be seen and, and heard and appreciated? Are they going to feel welcomed? And that's really the first step, right? Because if you have people come in and, um, 
not feel like this is their space or they're welcome, they're not going to come back kids. Uh, so I think that, I think the coaches are really, really key, um, in terms of, and having enough of them. And I would add not relying on volunteers. Volunteers are fantastic. But one thing I learned early on was you have to put money into this. If you believe in it and you want to do it, you need to actually have staff. So, um, make that budget line, you know, for wealthy kids from privileged backgrounds, we don't rely on volunteers to tutor them or to coach them. We have paid staff. And so I would say, treat these programs the same way. So if you want them to be successful, hire some fantastic coaches. I don't know if Matt or Ted want to add to that at all. Ted? Ted, you are muted. You're muted, Ted. Ted sorry, geez, that's annoying. I apologize. Um, when I was coaching division one rowing, uh, one of the things we talked about was it gets real simple, real quick, boats, oars, athletes, right? And, and, and you can do that in any environment. And what Amanda said about uh, investing in the people that shape the experience for the kids you're serving or the, or the adults or whoever it is, uh, that investment is uh, the lifeblood of your organization. You'll live or die by it. Um, we have 24 full-time staff. We employ anywhere from 75 to 120 part-timers through the course of a summer. Uh, I showed you a slide where we made an investment in the professional development of our staff. We spend hundreds of thousands of dollars developing our people. It's, the, it's, it's literally the ethos of your organization, period. And Matt? Yeah, echoing uh, both Ted and Amanda and that that investment in staff up front being key. Uh, you want to make sure everybody that comes to your boathouse for the first time feels comfortable, feels safe, has a good first experience, so they'll want to come back for the second experience. And that really goes comes back to having key staff in place that can that can communicate what the sport is, provide that first on water opportunity, that introduction. Um, that you know, motivates people to come back and learn more and do more and row more and paddle more. So really having that, you know, word of mouth is honestly one of the best recruiters for our sport, particularly once uh, we get an athlete, one athlete in a school, the word of mouth just spreads between the students and families. So you that first experience um, and making sure that it's safe and impactful is key. Excellent. Well, it sounds like staff is, is a consistent uh, answer in there. So I'm going to go to some of the questions uh, related to that. And here's a, a more uh, a technical question that was asked of uh, what is your recommended coach to rower ratio? And is it different between junior masters, sculling, sweeps, etc.? I think, Matt, you made ours up at Rower New York. <laughs> so... Yeah, I mean, um, the idea depends, right? Yeah, it, it does depend. I mean, ideally, you know, the I think the magic number um, is 10 to 1, um, you know, which is essentially 1 8 per coach um, and having that one, that 10 to 1 ratio. But it really does depend on the program and the skill level of the athletes um, and, the, and the conditions that you row on. Safety and the environment that you row in is a big factor in, in, in st uh, staff to athlete ratios as well. So there's a lot of factors in play, um, a lot of great resources out there, depending on the bodies of water. Um, to help guide that. But um, I would say, I don't, uh, um, I'm sure there's other coaches on here that might have another number in mind too, but like really 10 to one is an ideal ratio to get to. Uh, Sierra, I were in the same ballpark, uh, slightly lower, about eight to one anytime we have uh, people in single skulls, just sculling alone, just because of the number of boats. But, uh, you know, speaking as somebody who hates the answer, it depends, uh, it depends. Um, and a big part of it is just what, what the conditions are in, in your boat club and the experience of, of the people and your coaches. I would say, you know, just as a benchmark. But always like, coaches. But always coaches. Yep, for us, it's always oh, coaches. Sorry. Uh, sorry, Ted. Always coaches, never no coaches. Never no coaches. <laughs> Ever. Never no coaches, right. Yeah. And for someone starting... Ever. Uh, a community rowing program and when they're looking into the future of having a full-blown successful program like like each of you have or have had 
um, what what kind of uh, part of the budget is dedicated to, to payroll? Uh, Pre-COVID, our payroll was uh, a little a uh, little under half between payroll benefits, taxes, everything invested. Um, CRI is about a $6 million organization. I think our annual payroll is about 2.5 and then you add in other stuff and it's, it's a lot. Um, I think the difficulty with a lot of rowing clubs is that, and, and this is something I find in some of these discussions is, is that the scale of our organization, my organization anyway, reflects incremental improvements as opposed to where organizations need to start from. And I think when the, the difficulty in rowing clubs is that there's a dearth of um, there's a dearth of understanding that that no no organization begins with all of the stuff that we've done, but the prioritization about what's important to the organization really helps focus the resources you put to it. And so one of the things that I think the reason Three Rivers and CRI and Row New York have thrived is because of the commitment to the people that actually deliver the mission. Uh, we've all had our ups and ups and downs, but that is the foundation for, and that is the investment that we've made in making the mission come alive in the sport. Versus thinking we have to buy more boats or we need better boats or we should get a boathouse. The dis those, those are distractions to the core of, of delivery of the mission. And when you think about mission delivery, you need to have the right people doing that. Matt? Yeah, I mean, uh, pre-COVID, our salary was about the same percentage uh, that Ted mentioned, uh, just on a much smaller uh, annual budget scale. Um, our annual budget's a uh, little bit closer to 2.5 to 3 million. Um, but yeah, again, I mean, investing in that staff is is crucial to to the underlying success. And, and I, I can't add more than what Ted said um, about the, the other distractions that go along with the, making sure the mission is um, delivered effectively. Amanda? Yeah, I, th I think you always want that to be your largest line in, in a budget um, is, your, is your staff. They're, you know, they're your biggest resource. And I think, and just to add to that, I think what, what, where people come from is the college model or the high school model where, where staffing isn't the biggest line, where there's equipment focus or other things. And I think that's where some of this might get lost. Um, just, to, just to add some color to, to that comment, because I think it's true. And there are assumptions that other people do it differently. And the answer is there's no, there's no way around it. I see a question here in regards to, um, how often your facilities are unavailable uh, for community growing uh, due to events. So do, do, you, uh, do you share a common mission of hosting events at your facilities? And, and if so, I, I guess, how do you de-conflict de programming and events? How about Matt? Um, we really don't offer a lot of non-rowing or rowing related events at our boathouses. Um, that might be, <laughs> I'm laughing a little bit. Um, when I was working at the Westside Rowing Club and we built the Frank Lloyd Wright design boathouse, um, it was designed to be an event space too. And we had a lot of weddings and um, you know, the expectations just were in such direct conflict with um, our ability to carry out our mission at the end of the day. You know, we thought we'd raise money by doing events to supplement the mission, but when you're trying to host a wedding and people expect all the boats to be removed from the boathouse so they can have a dance floor and it just, it, it just didn't work out as well. Um, so that ever since then, um, I, I've, personally been anti non-rowing events. Um, I'm a big fan of like small community meeting types of events where people get to come in and see the boathouse, but not necessarily private events that would impact our ability to shut down. Bringing the community in while rowing and paddling is key, uh, but never um, to the expense or the deterrent of rowing and paddling. I think Matt, well, I wonder where Ted's gonna come in on this, but there's like no worse combination than weddings and an active boathouse. If you, I mean, we could list all that we, Matt was there when we tried to do it in New York and it was just short of a disaster on a regular basis because 
you know, no one cares more about their big day than the bride and groom. And, you know, no one cares less about someone's big day than teenagers after a big row, you know? So I don't recommend it. Um, I do. That said, I think there's a lot, there are lots of opportunities for other community um, engagements or gatherings, you know, that are just not so, um, you know, weddings are very special thing. And so I would say, you know, you could do so many other things, volunteer drives, you can do study sessions. We did lots of great things with other outdoorsy groups, um, you know, groups that kayak around Manhattan. And those were sort of beautiful relationships, but not weddings but maybe ted maybe ted has a, yeah has no we, the code we, on that we've uh we've, we do weddings uh we do special events um we charge out the nose for it um so it's worth it to us uh because we commit our janitorial staff as well as the displacement of programs and we share that with people when they make a commitment um we've had events as big as 2500 people at our event uh, uh um uh, two-day events where we've shut down the boathouse and uh taken all the boats out of the building uh, and those are game changing all hands on deck events that uh, we declare openly what we're making and the reason why we're doing it and where that money goes. Um, so our, 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 we, we've gotten away from that, um, but um, we used to do about 42 events a year. And I think the sweet spot is around a quarter of that. To everything Matt and Amanda said, uh, you know, the, the facility is really dedicated to service to the people who, who are coming in regularly. Um, one thing I will say is that uh, CRI did uh, uh, pilot uh, some corporate rowing programs, sort of after work uh, uh, softball model of, of going down to the boathouse and, and doing some introductory rowing uh, once a week for six weeks. And at the end of it, we get a food truck and some cold beers and everybody comes down. That actually translated into marketing to corporate events where uh, right before the shutdown, we had hosted events for Fortune 100 companies with their C-suite executives and put some events together that were, that were both quite profitable, but also introduced uh, some potential corporate partners to our organization in a way that was more intimate because they learned how to row. Uh, and they had time with me. Um, the last one was State Farm, where we had their C-suite come to CRI for about five hours. Uh, all the Cs came and they rode together. They were completely resistant to the entire experience and they left feeling great about it. Uh, didn't turn into a corporate partnership, but, um, but a great pilot, right? And I think part of, part of what you might take away from this is uh, uh, there's, no, there's no better way to destroy the morale of your staff than to say you're hosting a wedding at your boathouse. And everybody has to clean up and you know be on their best behavior, um, but it's a good way to experiment with uh, the testing the resiliency of your staff and also thinking about ways to generate what would be a natural source of revenue. And I, I know Ted, you got into um, a, a, a good level of um, financials and how you how you finance community rowing. Matt and Amanda, do you have anything uh, to add in in regards to? financing the program? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a space I'm very comfortable in. And I would say, um, yeah, there are different revenue models, right? There's CRI does this really well, um, which is the, the earned income piece, right? So learn to row courses and, you know, really reasonable prices, but it still generates revenue. Um, so fee for service programs. And then there's the fundraising side of things. So, you know, I would say you definitely want a board of directors that's engaged and giving. Uh, at Run New York, we had a give get of $20,000 a year. And, um, you know, really having a development team that's going to go out there and look for foundation grants, uh, that's going to do look for government grant opportunities, individuals. I think the most low hanging fruit is definitely from individuals. You really need that expert on your team who's a development person who can raise money for, you know, especially if you're doing outreach. I would say one of the things that made us most successful at Roe New York on the fundraising side was the fact that we had an academic program tied to our rowing program. There are so many funders, especially foundations. We do about a million dollars a year in foundation giving. They would not give any money if we didn't also have a college prep piece. So if anyone wants to talk about that offline or do another session, Tomas, sometime. 
but Matt, Ted, I'm sure I'm missing things too. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're balancing a lot of the um, cost for programming as well as um, foundation giving for our first row 2.0 and adaptive programs, which gets most of the grants. But, you know, our, our big profit makers are similar to what Ted said. We run a summer rowing league. It's been a staple of the organization for about fit, over 20 years now where we get um, 48 eights out every week during the summer and hour and a half blocks and it's burgers and beers after each row. Um, it's really community based. Um, and, um, you know, that's what we really been a big um, source of our income and partnership generation. Um, so couldn't do that in 2020. Looking forward to bringing it back safely in 2021 and uh, going from there. Ted, do you have anything to add to this topic? I think it's a it's a critical one and a great one to end on. Um, uh, uh, just a lot of what I'm hearing from Amanda and um, and Matt is that a lot of the ideas that you're hearing were generated by your staff, if I'm not mistaken. So you know, there might be a theme here somewhere in all this conversation, but I think um, I think really you know an organization that responds from the creativity of your people around how they can serve their community. Uh, and then integrating that into how your mission can be amplified and broadcast to people that are committed to it that want to support it, right? And um, and finding ways that people who want to pay for rowing services, uh, whether it's an after work beer league or youth development during the summer, or whether it's in, in the case of what Amanda did at Road York with finding a really good development staff who are able to really drive uh, uh, fundraising revenue through telling the story of the organization and um, and really getting people inspired by, by the successes of what, what her organization did, uh, her and Mets did in New York, so. Wow, Ted, thank you. That was an incredible summary of uh, today's discussion. And uh, again, thank you to each of our uh, panelists for taking time to share with us from their experiences, knowledge and wisdom. And I wanna thank everyone who joined us today, all the great questions. Uh, Stephen, thanks for uh, posing those questions to our panelists. Uh, just uh, really appreciate it. I feel like I, uh, was in a master's class today on uh, community rowing and that's exactly what I was hoping for. So uh, I'm grateful to each of you for uh, taking this time and uh, Amanda, especially for taking some time out of your vacation to join us for this. So uh, thanks again and it's everyone just have a yeah. great evening. Thank you. Amanda, you wanna have any uh, final words for us? No, just, I mean, I'm, we're so thrilled on behalf of U.S. Rowing that you all are, are you know, going down this road um, because, you know, we're biased, but I, you know, there's nothing better than a um, community boathouse. I think Ted and Matt would probably agree. It's, it's the bringing together of so many wonderful things. Um, and Micanopy is great. Thank you, Stephen. I love it here. <laughs> <laughs> Even though the Wi-Fi is bad. Uh, maybe that's one of the benefits Thank of being you. there. <laughs> and uh, Matt, you have a few uh, yes. final comments for us as well. Uh, no, I just really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk. It's something I'm very passionate about and it's thrilled to see it taking root in Sarasota and just um, what you guys are look, really looking forward to seeing what you guys do for the community down there. You know, it's going to be great. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone, and have a great evening.